fun Should ever listen to my old man You know he can hold me forever I didn't sign up with you I'm not a present for your friends to open This boy's too young to be singing the Society, how you can't put me in your penthouse. I'm going back to my cloud, back to the howling old owl in the woods, hunting the horny black toad. Oh, I finally decided my future. I'll shoot down your plane It might take a couple of vodka and tonics To get you on your feet again Maybe you'll find a replacement There's plenty like me to be found Among rows who ain't got a penny Sniffing for tidbits like you On the ground
boys and girls, and of course the graduating class. Especially Mr. Glenn Robinson, I can't believe the last we've had to do this. Um, it really is an honour, but I'm thinking there were more deserving students that could have been asked. When I saw Ms. Robin Griffin at a function a few months ago, we reminisced about the class she taught, it was 2011, but quite early on in the piece she did ask, so who are the good students in your ear again? <laughs> Which really did not. Um, it's, it's nice to know that I am held in such high regards. <laughs> Ms. Chesney is wondering why they allowed me 10 minutes of uninterrupted speech time to talk about myself. Uh, as my form teacher, she knows all too well what I'm capable of. There are so many reasons why I'm amazed to have been given this privilege, but as we say too often recently, these are truly unprecedented times. <laughs> Gosh, I'm more nervous. I did a bulletin last night to about a million people, but this is more nerve wracking. So uh, there you go. But I genuinely am honoured, and it is a real privilege to be here, to be able to, in some small way, maybe bring a bit of clarity or at least another perspective to what I remember as being one of the most hectic times of my life. So I can empathise with how you may be feeling leaving school, the only thing you've known for the past 13 years, and moving on to unknown pathways. I'm going to try and keep the start of this light and breezy, maybe go through a couple of anecdotes, hopefully a little laugh or two. Then I'm going to get a bit serious to keep us all on our toes and go through a uh, personal story. Um, and uh, I'll try and bring it back and finish off with some words of wisdom so we can all go home and enjoy them. A bit of background from me my musical journey began with the piano in primary school. Actually, that's a lie, I was a reporter. <laughs> but the instrument I chose to play was the piano, and there was something so enjoyable about that to be able to whack the keys and create something not necessarily beautiful, but at least wonderful. <laughs> and that spark of creativity was there when you had an outlet to make something of your own. I never initially learned to read music, which will probably explain a lot to the teachers. I learned a method called Simply Music, which teaches you to play songs by ear more or less. In primary school, I took up the classic guitar, which gave me a placement to the guitar here in the music program, but I did switch to piano later, um, as I taught that, uh, as I learned in primary school as well. And looking back on those days, they were great. Um, as you all agree, being in the music department here, really is being part of the family. Playing in the guitar ensemble, I was able to masquerade as a guitarist for three whole years, but I did enjoy it. And then music tour came along, and to say it was the highlight of my time in the music program would be another say. <laughs> and for those of you in the front lucky enough to have gone on tour this year, I'm oh, sorry, Sam. <laughs> But for a 15 year old to have had the opportunity to travel to the outside of the world, world with his best friends, and perform in some incredible places was nothing short of remarkable. Roaming the streets of New York City in groups of no less than four, of course, we made memories that I will never forget. But I couldn't stand up here and talk about musical memories without mentioning the days spent upstairs in the old apartment. With Ms. Griffin bearing the brunt of my energy in the final two years, she had to put up with way too many of my shenanigans that I care to admit. One memory that does stick out among the rest is when we would take advantage of the old keyboards in Opus 1 and 2. We learned fairly early on that if you chose the oboe setting, turned the volume up to full blast and hit a G sharp, it would sound exactly like the time used as the school bell. And I challenge anyone here who says it wasn't worth the effort just to leave class 30 seconds early. <laughs> Then came the time to leave the comfort of the school grounds. Without a clue, really, I had dreams of becoming a police officer, and that hasn't eventuated yet. But I channeled my interests and energies into journalism, and in particular broadcast journalism, which I studied at ECU, and then did a postgraduate broadcasting degree at WAPA, with a dream of mine of one day being able to read a TV news bulletin. And as of literally just last night, that dream came true when I had an opportunity to read national ABC late news bulletins across the country, across the entire network. <laughs> but back to those times early on, uni really was great. You get to figure out what you want to do while having fun at the same time. Travelling became a passion of mine, and I would take off as often as I could, oftentimes by myself, or to visit friends and family across the world. And I did say early on that the speech was going to be a bit serious. And this is the serious part. You 
think life is struggling along swimmingly, and then something happens that knocks you for a six. And you need resilience and strength to get through it. In 2016, I booked a trip to Africa with a mate, but unfortunately, about a month out, he couldn't go. But instead of cancelling the trip, I pushed ahead. I'd travelled alone by myself before, and I was looking for the next adventure. I spent five weeks travelling through Tanzania and a week on Zanzibar for New Measure. I spent five, oh, sorry, I, it was really the most incredible trip of my life. But then everything changed. I had a flight booked for early in the morning and had organised a taxi to the airport. But after getting in, I noticed we were driving the opposite way to the airport. The main road was empty at that time in the morning. Up ahead, I noticed two figures on the side of the road. The taxi pulled over and those two people got in, one in the front passenger seat and the other in the back next to me. My heart sank, fearing the worst, but I continued to make light conversation, as I do, to try and gauge what was happening. They assured me everything was fine and I could do nothing else but believe them. Then about 10 minutes later, we pulled into a dark side street and the car stopped. The man in the passenger seat turned to me and said, okay, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna rob you. If you cooperate, you're gonna get hurt. If you don't cooperate, you get very hurt. Do you understand? Of course I accepted. The three men walked through my belongings while threatening to kill me, and we then drove to an ATM where I was forced to drain my bank accounts. The ordeal lasted for over an hour, and I was left exhausted on the side of the road with nothing but empty bags and luckily my passport. A tuk tuk driver gave me a lift to the airport, and from there, after another ordeal of trying to book flights, find me that money, I finally made it back to Perth a couple of days later. Now, as, ten as intense as that was, I really was okay. I'd made it home safely, I wasn't physically hurt, and I didn't know. So the impact it had on my life was pretty minimal at that point. It was just a great fun story. But the thing about trauma is there's no telling when the after effects might hit. And when it hit me, it knocked me for a six. So a year into my first job as an ABC News reporter in Albany, I had my first panic attack. And then my second, and I wasn't really sure what was happening to me. I hadn't at the time even related the feelings to what had happened in Africa, but I realised that I needed to get help. So when I moved up to Perth to start a job in the metro newsroom, the panic attacks started again and they came back with a vengeance. The attacks lasted longer and I ended up entering into a bit of a depression. But with help I managed to get on top of things and I definitely do get stronger each and every day. Now I bring this story up not for sympathy or self-aggrandizement. I bring it up to say that sometimes life throws you a curveball. And it's about how we bounce back that really matters. And knowing where we can turn. And mental illness doesn't discriminate. And there may be times in the future where you feel, feel overwhelmed and unsure where to turn, but there is always support available. Just know there's always someone that you can reach out to. Life gets crazy and we put so much pressure on ourselves now more than ever, especially with the way things are at the moment. Didn't want you to get a bit serious, so I apologize. But I wanted to share the story in the hope that it's shown you that no matter who you are or where you are in life, you need to look after your physical and mental health because you don't know what's around the corner. To bring it back up, I'll say this though. When I was down, music did save me. Because music has the ability to make us feel, think, and live. Be proud that you've come through this amazing music program and will have memories and a love of music that will last a lifetime. Because that's what music is. It's so much more than anything that can be labeled or defined. It's so inherently personal to us all, in so many different ways, and yet it's so collective and communal. And to be able to participate in its creation, I think is nothing more than astounding. To retreat to a safe place and indulge in music is one of life's simple pleasures. So please let me say this. Don't stress about where you are in life right now. Don't stress about your exams, what you think you want to be, or where you think you want to go, or what your future's going to be. Because in the grand scheme of things, the grades don't matter. As I say, the jobs of tomorrow haven't been invented yet. And from personal experience, you have absolutely no idea what life's going to throw at you. So enjoy where you're at right now, and know that by having been part of a community and a family like this music department, and having made friendships beyond comprehension, it will serve you in ways you don't yet know, and you will be forever grateful for it. Thank you for listening. Thank you.
don't know whether that will be done yet. Our next graduate, Sophie Beaton. Sophie loves catching waves at the beach, diets, creative writing, and public speaking. Her preferences at her audition were cello, voice, and oboe.
So we should use their preferences for voice and guitar, and we should not underestimate the support of parents that has got these students to learn how to do Sean Patel auditioned on the piano. He loves. He loves.
，你不要发现小人是比他比较多的，他不敢死。Sorry, you can't work on the party. 
describes her as energetic, highly motivated, and a disciplined chorus star. Her favourite composer is Mozart. If she couldn't be a vocalist, she'd be happy to play the Our final graduate for tonight. She enjoys craft, sewing, and reading badminton, and uh, her school report describes her as a real gem. She smiles as the work gets harder, apparently. <laughs> and she was a finalist in South Padbury's Got Talent competition. <laughs> Excuse 
within a couple of months of graduating, died um, suddenly, and his parents, since that date, have uh, provided a memorial award to the top string student in each year in his memory. This year's Paul George Memorial Award goes to Anastasia. <laughs> Music captain's 
time you've seen the concert, where you get all prepared and decorated for the awaiting day. Our year group spent recess, lunch, and many hours before and after school organizing the skit performance, constructing the teacher's presence, and singing our final songs. And as the concert crept towards us, we kept persevering, or should I say scrambling, to get everything done. At this point, it felt like I had picked up another subject at school, and the pressure was certainly there. To ensure I wouldn't collapse during this crucial period as a Christmas tree, I got an iron infusion a couple days before the concert, which would supposedly get rid of my iron deficiency and give me what was described as an eruption of energy. Quite the contrary. <laughs> I woke up on the morning of the concert with a fever like I've never experienced before. So off to the hospital we went, did a couple tests and was all fine. Turns out I had a reaction to the infusion. Yay! <laughs> As the day passed, I decided I would just go home and try to mend this illness before the concert later that night. Nothing will stop me from performing what I had prepared for in the past couple weeks, except for the coronavirus. No, I didn't have COVID, but I did test for it, which luckily for me meant that I had to isolate until I got the results. So this Christmas tree didn't really get to show off its snazzy decks or pretty lights, being unable to attend the only concert in 2020, and my last concert as a church lens musician was pretty heartbreaking to say the least. But it really showed the true colours of everyone around me. It was overwhelming to feel so appreciated by all my fellow users and the teachers who have been by my side all the way. So overall, what I learned as a music captain was that all the stress and all the commotion really was worth every strand of hair that fell out. <laughs> it has been a team effort to get through this year. Without Cassie and Ellie's organisation help, without Sophie and Lisa and Phoebe's ability to quiet in the room, and without the support of all the teachers, Brendan and I would have never gotten up here alone. It truly has been such a pleasure to become closer to all of you, and I cherish all the memories we have made together. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> well, music graduates, we made it. As a group, we did indeed start from the very bottom of the pyramid in year seven, with probably 90 or more of us to only below 40 left surviving the flesh. Think about how far we've come individually and as a class in the space of six years. Thinking back to year seven, it seems like it was just yesterday. There was the first class, the first choir in the rehearsal, our first concert, the first girlfriend, the second girlfriend, <laughs> the third girlfriend, the not knowing that you're the problem. <laughs> I will always remember the first few weeks of year seven, I actually didn't attend any of my instrumental lessons because I thought they would call me up like in primary school. Let's just say, the music department was not so happy about that. <laughs> Yet, our hearts repaired and we grew physically and mentally stronger. This class of 2020 has undoubtedly, in my opinion, been one of the most successful and high achieving classes of Churchland's history. <laughs> Yet, our six years at Churchland's were no walk in the park. We were tasked with the gruelling hours of compulsory choir, the dreadful tests and exams that were presented, and the gut-wrenching hours of band and orchestra. Especially if you had band, Saturday band, man, that thing was painful. <laughs> like, come on, two or three hours of our weekend still going to school at 8.30 a.m. in the morning. But alas, we rose and came out with strong resilience and showed our dedication. Every student has experienced his or her fair share of disappointment and upset, including me. I'll never forget the day that I watched the Spider-Man movie for the first time. I leapt out of the couch and said to my mum, When I grow up, I want to be Spider-Man. She said, Brendan, grow up, you graduate in two weeks. <laughs> Thank you.
Things might not always go the way you plan, but I know we can all agree that this past is irrepressible. We survived a potential war, bushfires, toilet paper shortages, and still are in the process of surviving a pandemic. The fact that we made it here, decorated with all these awards and accomplishments, is just a testament to our perseverance and commitments to the music department. I think of this music department and the people involved, not as a community, but more as a family. To all my peers who are sitting behind me, I will cherish all the moments that we have created and shared together close and deeply in my heart. Without you wonderful people, I wouldn't be standing here tonight. You guys are truly created by I am today. On behalf of the students, we thank all of the marvellous teachers who have helped us out and created opportunities and gifted us our excellence in music. Thank you for tolerating with our horrific playing after not practising for weeks on end. Without you guys, Churchlands would just not be the prestigious music school we are. And on behalf of the staff and students, we thank you guys, the parents. As you sit there in those seats, looking at us all proud, maybe a little tear running down your face, <laughs> I thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for having to go out of your way, taking, taking and picking us up from rehearsals. I'm sorry you had to deal with that for six years. <laughs> Blame on the music department. <laughs> Thank you for being such an astounding audience, and without you guys, you would just be crickets chirping after we finish performing. The family that I stand with has molded me into who I am, and I truly appreciate each and every one of you that has been a part of the journey. Thank you.
Mrs. Griffin. And finally, Mrs. Sim. Thank you. 